Hello everyone and welcome to my artist talk, Reflections from the End of the Spool, Origins, Development and Process of a String Portrait Series. I just want to start off today by acknowledging that I'm streaming from the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. To begin this talk, I'll, I'll speak to the origins of the, the project and some of the influences behind it. And then I'll also talk about some conceptual pieces that I did a lot of research about a couple years ago. And then I'll give a little bit of a sneak peek into some possible future directions that I'll be taking with my work. So I think a lot of you know me already, but if you don't, my name is Maren Kathleen Elliott, and I'm an interdisciplinary artist from Edmonton, Alberta. Um, I did a degree in psychology and music from the University of Alberta in 20, graduated in 2016. And since then, I've worn a few different hats. I've been worked in mental health. I taught music. Um, I've, I've been involved with a lot of different movement, Pilates, dance type of things. And I think all of those different experiences, although they're not directly related to making visual art, have really informed who I am as an artist and they've informed my work as well. If I'm just going to make a note, if you, any of you have questions for me at the end of this talk, there'll be a little question period and if there's time, I'll, I'll answer some of them. And you can just email those to stringalism2020 at gmail.com. That email will be up the whole time. So if something comes up, feel free to shoot me an email and I'll be checking it on my phone at the end. So when I was kind of an older teen or maybe in my early adulthood, and I discovered that art could be more than just a therapeutic expression or a technical exercise, but also a way of examining and questioning and understanding the world, I developed a real fascination with unconventional materials. And this pattern is something that's existed in my work ever since then. Um, I just included some examples of early works in this little collage here. So I made pieces, sculptures out of small hospital vials. I used to work in a hospital as well, so I'd collect, sometimes they'd be getting rid of things, so do some found object sculpture, or drawing and printing on underwear, making a tree stump out of toilet paper rolls. I asked all my neighbors and friends if they had been collecting toilet paper rolls. I made that about 10 years ago, but it just very recently has become quite topical again. Um, or just, yeah, collecting, objects that might not necessarily be associated with fine art all the time. And there are a couple of artists who really influenced me in this way um, of having materials inform the meaning of the work. One of them is Vic Muniz. So Vic Muniz is a Brazilian American artist and photographer. And he uses materials to inform the meaning of his work in often a really clever and tongue-in-cheek way. Um, on the left here, there's a piece from his series, The Sugar Children. Um, and he, he made these based off of photographs he took when visiting St. Kitts. And that's, it's, it's an island where there's a lot of sugar production. That's one of the main industries. And he noticed it, where he had the perception that the adults were weary and it seemed like life had taken the sweetness out of them. And these are the people who are working in the sugar processing or working in, um, to create sugar, but the, sh the children weren't. And so he, he took uh, photos of, of different kids and ended up replicating their likenesses with sugar on a black surface. The second in the middle here is from his series, Pictures of Garbage. And these are photos taken from above of garbage that has been arranged to look like, uh, you know, paintings by the great masters and very famous works of art from art history. Things that are often put on a pedestal behind the velvet rope, uh, deemed very, very valuable. But the fact that he's making them out of our material refuse is kind of 
that uh, uh, is kind of a fun contrast, and I think it says a lot. The one on the right, I feel like I really had to include this as well. This is Pictures of Thread, and so it's a series of landscapes he created in the late 90s, and he would create the imagery with, with thread, and he titled each piece by the number of yards of thread that he used. So you can see with Vic Nunes, materials in a lot of his works have been really key. Another artist I discovered early on who inspired me to think about materials and their meaning in art was Brian Jungen. He's uh, an indigenous Canadian and Swedish, well, he has Swedish ancestry and indigenous ancestry um, out of BC. And he also has created a lot of work out of unconventional materials. So um, if any of you watching from Edmonton saw, he had an exhibit at the Art Gallery of Alberta a few years ago, and he had these giant, beautiful whale skeleton mobiles hanging, made actually out of lawn chairs. Um, the piece you see here is from Prototypes of a New Understanding, and they're made out of cut up and reconstructed Nike Air Jordan shoes. So the fact that he used Nike Air Jordans to create sculptures that mimic traditional Northwest Coast indigenous imagery um, allowed him to draw a parallel between uh, kind of the, the Western obsession with material objects and brands and having stuff as a status symbol and also the collection of the fetishization of indigenous and other exotic cultures and kind of the collection of them in, in museum, museums and uh, anyway, drawing an interesting parallel with, with the meaning of those two things just by making this kind of imagery out of that shoe. Jessica Stockholder is another artist who really made me think about materials and meaning. I think for Jessica Stockholder, her influence on me uh, takes shape less in form than it does in philosophy. A lot of what she does is large-scale abstract installations. Um, she's out of Chicago, and I'm just going to read this quote of hers on what she's thinking of. Because um, she, 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 a lot of the stuff she does, she'll go to Home Depot or to Canadian Tire or whatever. Maybe not Canadian Tire, she's American. But she'll get objects that are made en masse that are normally not seen as valuable, and she'll create value by placing them together really consciously. She says, I like the color of plastic. I like that there the objects are inexpensive but gorgeous compared to diamonds, which are so expensive, but probably no more beautiful than these plastic things. I think these things are stunningly beautiful. And they don't last long. Not because plastic doesn't last long, it does, but because the objects themselves aren't strong and people don't value them. And I think that makes me think of kind of the, the Zen concept of a beginner's mind and looking at things, or trying, I don't know if we can really do this, but trying to look at things without all these constructed systems of meaning around them and just taking them in for what they are. And when I'm working, for example, with the string, that is something that really, like, noticing how they something will curl or noticing the texture that things will make if I cut them a certain way or if I drop something and it falls, like, just being able to appreciate the beauty and things like texture, I think. Um, is another thing that, that Jessica Stockholder helped me think about. Another influence, I think, behind this series of portraits in string is traditions of textiles. All the images you see here are from my, my childhood home or from my home. Uh, my mom is a quilter, and I have aunts who crochet and I come from, and she's embroiders too, and so I think I come from a long line of women who used, did fiber arts, 
whether it was weaving or knitting. I have some, there's my great grandmother's Josephine's embroidery is somewhere I think still. Um, and so there is a familiarity to it for me. And I think there's this sense of connectedness to it as well. Perhaps the biggest influence behind my series of portraits in string uh, just comes from a fascination with mark making. So ever since I could probably hold a pencil and doodle and color with crayons, I have really loved doing that. And it, it's been a really satisfying uh, and engaging process. I just included this, I thought it was a bit funny. This is a portrait of the artist circa 1996. So here I was really young, I, I don't know, five years old, four years old, something like that. Um, early in grade school maybe, or just about to enter. And I am drawing a picture of myself drawing and getting lost in my imagination and fascinated by all the scribbles and just the power that uh, that we can have when we, we can create a mark on a surface. I also am really interested in depicting the human figure and figure drawing, life drawing, and that as, as a practice. Um, both a meditative kind of a meditative pr practice and also just a technical practice. When I was a teenager, I got this book out of the library on figure drawing, and it had a bunch of exercises um, on ways to approach it or things to think about when you were drawing your model. And one of them was called the ball of yarn technique, and it's kind of getting people to be more gestural in what they're doing. And the invitation was to leave your pen or your or charcoal or whatever, your, but leave your line, your mark maker on the paper and just pretend that you're surrounding the form with yarn to create the sensation of mass. So this is a, a drawing from my archives um, that reminded me of that. Here's some other examples. Uh, these are student drawings from the book, The Natural Way to Draw by Kimon Nicolades. So you can see here, some of the marks made are giving you a sense of the, the direction of the limbs and under, and they're just beautiful. I find them really beautiful. Another couple examples where you can kind of see the comparison that can be made between some kinds of mark making and using yarn or long strands of fiber to create imagery. So I, I liked that and I found it uh, challenging and I was thinking a lot about this ball of yarn technique and I wondered at some point, what would it be like to work with lines, actual yarn, actual yarn and work with lines that you can touch? Um, so you'd be, in some ways, bringing the drawing process into three-dimensional kind of experience in some ways. And um, yeah, it, it stuck with me for, for a long time. I think I'm also a super tactile person, like if I go to a store and, uh, you know, to buy clothes or anything, first thing I'm doing is touching it to see if it's something that I can tolerate the feeling of. So that t felt sense is really important. Although right now with coronavirus, I wouldn't be doing that. But anyway, I started experimenting and I tried different kinds of glues and different thicknesses of threads. And I thought I would start out in black and white on a tone surface, much like a lot of people traditionally will, will depict the figure on toned paper with black and white charcoal. Um, because I think that's a really beautiful way to depict light and shadow with a, a lot of really nice contrast, but also 
because it's hard to work with it. I was wrapping my head, wrapping the threads around my head, but trying to wrap my head around how to create recognizable imagery and likenesses with this material. And I thought if I put color into it, it would just be too much to process. So those were early days. And after I figured out a kind of glue that I liked and I, an approach that I wanted to take, I started to source imagery. Um, these are photos that I took in 2016. And I set out to just collect a variety of different faces. Um, most of the people are, I talked about this a lot if you were at my opening reception last night, but a lot of the folks that I depicted in the series are people who I know really well, either they're, they're friends or relatives or former roommates. And there were a few too that I just happened to meet and I, I thought like they had a great energy, they seemed like they'd, they'd be open to something like this. And um, there was maybe something really interesting about the way they looked that I thought would be cool to try to depict with this material, this black and white crochet thread on gray. And I started creating. Here's some stills from a time-lapse video I made over a summer. So the thing about working with string to make something this size is it's a really slow burn. It's a long process. And it takes me like two seconds to like envision something I'd like to try. And I can sketch it out first, I, I usually do. But the time between kind of that mental image or sense of direction and the completion of whatever that is like on the actual masonite surface with the thread is, is a long time. And there's a lot of slow, repetitive actions that happen over the course of getting there. So I, I had some shower thoughts during this time. The internet says that shower thoughts are the perfect combination of solitude and monotonous ritual, so there's space for contemplation. And there was a lot of space for that as I placed string over string, you know, line by line, one at a time. Um, one of the things I started to wonder is, or think about was, you know, if I had been so inspired by these other artists who use their choice of material or medium to influence the meaning of their work, was there something about that in the string portraits? Was there something about that in this pro project? And working with string is really, it didn't feel so much like I'm in charge when I first started out in the same way. Like, if I were to compare the experience of making my very first string portrait with drawing a similar image in charcoal, with the charcoal I would feel, or, or ink, I, I would feel like I've got a tool and I'm in control and I'm making choices. But with the thread, there was a little bit more give and take. It wouldn't always land exactly how I wanted it to. But because none of the marks were permanent until the glue dried, it allowed me to try over and over again. So there became this kind of back and forth between the artist and the artwork itself. And I thought, this is really relational. There's a real dialogue happening between me and this, uh, this future piece of art, this work in progress. And isn't that also, you know, if this relationship is what's forming the image of a person, aren't relationships also huge in informing who we all are as individuals. And consequently, as social beings, doesn't the construction of the mind and the self and individual identity rest upon relational experience? So I was thinking about kind of how me making this artwork related to how, you know, how an art piece becomes what it is and how that relates to how we become who we all are as people. There's me wondering. I did a residency in 2017 at a place called the Arts-Based Research Studio at the University of Alberta. 
And this space is, it's a black box theater with a kitchen in the front and it's more, uh, I'd say, catered towards writers and uh, people in theater and academics. And I think I was one of the first visual artists who had ever done a residency there. And I felt a constant fear and pressure to kind of not be making a mess in the space and to be res respecting the, the pristine nature of this theater space. Uh, and that was, that was pretty prohibitive uh, in terms of me getting artwork done because it is messy. I am messy. Even if I try to be neat, I you know usually end up with stuff on my face or if you've seen me eat even like stuff everywhere. I don't know. I don't know how people are tidy, but especially working with glue and string, even if I laid down tarps, it, it was really challenging and it felt really confining. But I took this time to turn towards those shower thoughts that I had had and do a little bit more research on what other people had written and read and, and thought about on similar themes, especially out of the field of psychology because that is my educational origin and it's really a, a, something that fascinates me. Um, so I was thinking about this, that our dialogical art, the dialogical mind, and trying to make sense of these concepts. We're fundamentally social beings. In fact, just minutes after birth, an infant will respond preferentially to face-like stimuli compared to other stimuli. So that's been researched and, and how they do that is that they would take the newborn human infant and show it something that looks more like a face, with maybe eyes, shapes, and a mouth shape versus a, a more abstract thing. And when they saw the face-like structures, they would actually suck their soothers more and that's how um, we could tell that they were more stimulated by it. I think this is a really good case for doing portraiture as an artist. I think we're all hardwired to like faces and be fascinated by faces. Um, anyway, that's a side note. Uh, but our survival was really in many ways as a species, I think, dependent upon the social nature of, of how we are and the importance of uh, grouping and working together. We don't have claws, we're hairless, we're small, um, but we did have group bonds and we were able to divide tasks and um, we have what social neuroscientist Pascal Vritica calls, he's going to just read his quote on this, he calls it a highly sophisticated social processing machine that enables us to engage in complex social interactions and to maintain relationships to a great number of individuals as well as groups. And we're so wired for this that even if someone has an experience of being excluded, it will light up the pain centers of their brain. So that's how just like primal that is for us to be connected. I looked at some perspectives from psychology on this, and I'm going to read you a little bit about, uh, I, I, I wrote, I did some research and I wrote, so I'm just going to do a little bit of a reading from that time um, that looked at perspectives from some other academics and researchers and thinkers. Um, so, yeah. I talked about a little bit about like our survival because of our ability to, to work cooperatively. Developmental and comparative psychologist Michael Tomasello has theorized that humans evolve something he calls joint intentionality, which not only gave us an edge from a survival standpoint, but also paved the groundwork for how we think today. Tomasello defines joint intentionality as everything from collaborative acts of problem solving to complex sociocultural institutions. In the early days of human evolution, this could have looked like division of labor on a shared task, with each, each individual understanding that fulfilling a particular role would contribute to the successful outcome of the group as a whole. And today, as the infrastructure within which we interact has become more and more complex, 
I'm sure joint intentionality looks like a lot more than that. Um, but it's really interesting uh, that I think this idea um, of this kind of cooperative rationality shaped our view of in and out groups, right and wrong, and other ways of operating and orienting in the world. Um, so that ties, those ties, I'm thinking about the thread again, this things that, that tie us together and, and make who we are. In his book, Consciousness and the Social Brain, Princeton-based neuroscientist Michael Graziano also discusses a kind of cooperative rationality in the form of social thinking. Social thinking involves using an observation of other people to draw conclusions even before interaction occurs. For instance, if someone I knew had a stain on their shirt, okay, not only would I be able to observe the existence of this stain, but by following that person's gaze and other postural and expressive cues, I would be able to make inferences as to their awareness or lack thereof of the situation, of the stain or whatever situation it is. I am, in a way, using what I see in front of me, playing it against what I have learned in the past, and combining these two things to get into the head of the other person. Now, of course, social thinking is imperfect, and we're not always right when we make assumptions about other people and what we first see. But nonetheless, most neurotypical individuals possess impressive aptitude for social thinking. I think social thinking can also apply not only to just looking at another person in real life, but also in when we look at images of people. So if you go to a gallery and you see the, I don't know, you look at the Mona Lisa, Maybe you see a little bit of a smile and you imagine what that feeling would be like and why this subject might be feeling that way. And if any of you were watching the opening reception last night, there were some dance interpretations of some of my portraits by dancers who had never met me and they'd never met the subjects of the portraits and yet they were able to construct all kinds of meanings around what this person might be. And I, I think that's a really interesting example of maybe how social thinking can apply to images of, of people in art. Um, yeah, I'm gonna skip neglect. It's very interesting. Uh, but Graziano like, also talks about a couple different areas of the brain that are important in this social thinking ability. And when those areas are damaged, it, it's a catastrophic disruption of our uh, awareness of the world around us sometimes. So some folks with neglect, for example, if you were to give them a clock, they would write the numbers 1 to 12, but they'd only write them on the one side of the circle. It's like the other side doesn't even exist somehow. So. Um, I guess the question is, or the thought is, if awareness is so disrupted when the social machinery of the brain is damaged, perhaps it is the same machinery that is also responsible for attributing awareness to other people that also participates in constructing one's own awareness and attributing it to oneself. Graziano goes on to conclude that consciousness is a result of social intelligence, the ability to understand the minds of other people turn inwards on ourselves. Or maybe it's the stories of other people that we just see, even just images of other people. Um, before Vritica, before Tomasello, and Graziano, there was a Soviet psychologist in the early 20th century named Lev Vygotsky, who coined the idea of the dialogical mind. According to Vygotsky, thought is fundamentally dialogical in nature, and draws upon the structures of interpersonal exchange. With this in mind, one can wonder if it is the accumulation of many internalized narrative pseudo-conversations that is at the root of our self-awareness and construction of personal identity. One relatable example of dialogical thinking can be found in the case of something that some psychologists have called imaginal dialogues. And it was described by Hermans and all as follows. Imaginal dialogues play a central role in our daily lives. 
They exist alongside actual dialogues with real others and interwoven with actual interactions, they constitute an essential part of our narrative construction of the world. Even if we are outwardly silent, for example, we find ourselves communicating with our parents, our consciences, our gods, our reflection in the mirror, a photograph of someone we miss, a figure from a movie or a novel, a dream, and he goes on, and I could just say, like, a string portrait, you know. But it's, it's uh, just a really interesting and different way of thinking about how our minds come to be. And, um, my, yeah, if you look at kids, actually, they, uh, they start before they're, like, a lot of kids, when they play, they'll um, narrate what's going on. They'll say, oh, well, we're going to go over there. And, and it's only until they, they become a little bit older that they internalize these thoughts. And these, that whole language is, uh, comes from exchanges where, with their primary caregiver and the people that they hear all around them. It's cool. It's cool stuff. I know that was a wormhole, and it's not super like tr art related, but I think it's really key in terms of what motivated me when I was making this body of work is just this this thought of the impact of interactions and the like unfathomable complexity of that, and that our brains are always seeking out. Or our minds are always, we're always seeking out ways to, um, to like the relationships between ourselves and other people that we see or that we imagine. Um, a lot of uh, 20th century psychology had this tendency to, to describe the mind like a computer. And I think even a lot of us today, sometimes we can think of people as being like, computer, little computer in a skull with the flesh sack around it and the mind is up here. But when you think about the mind as a dialogical in nature, it takes the mind out of the physical person and into the interactions that happen outside of them and the memories of those. It's neat. It's complex. It's compelling. And those are some of the things that I thought about when I was making my portraits. I don't get that really. It's beyond me. And I don't get fully every tangle and every curl that forms the likeness. But eventually, it becomes something that we can make sense of. These are just a couple examples of finished works. I'm not going to talk about individual pieces. I did that yesterday. But yeah. If you want to see more of them, um, it's people and their stories, and imagine your own stories about them, or just take a, a closer look at the artwork, I do have a 3D virtual gallery that's up. Um, and it'll be up until the end of this month. So you can take a look at all 11 pieces. I took a really long time to finish this project from start to finish. I think like when I started out and I was really interested in like the feeling of lines and stuff, it was almost like, I'm going to make this technical exercise where I mimic black and white charcoal drawings and I'm going to use people because I think people are super interesting and cool and I like to interact with them and take photos of them. Um, I, I, I don't know, I thought it was going to take me maybe a year to do that. I knew it was ambitious, but um, it took longer and, and part of that was circumstantial. I didn't have a studio for a year and there were a lot of other balls in the air. Um, but one thing that continued to give me motivation while I worked and continued to engage me was really that idea of like being with the material in the moment and noticing how the glue would dry on something or how the strings would create this kind of luscious flowing texture sometimes. Um, and all the different textures that people have in their hair and on their facial hair and on their clothing and the challenge of trying to create the illusion of that with this material. That kept things interesting. 
And I was also noticed, especially when I did the last half of the, the body of work, I was at the Ottawa School of Art for residency. And sometimes I'd be halfway through one of these portraits and I just, I would kind of want to stop. I think there's something really ghostly and intriguing about them when they aren't completely filled in and mimicking the photograph more like the early ones did. Um, ghostly. Yeah. It, there's this kind of a strange psychology to that. Maybe there's even more space for our imaginations to tell stories. And it's also more expressive on my side as an artist instead of just seeing a photo for reference and trying to be like a glorified printer. It's making decisions about what am I going to show and what am I going to leave open and what kinds of other marks do I want to include in this. So this is Cyber Shandin. It's one of the last pieces that I made. And I think that if I, I continue doing figurative work and portraiture, that's a direction that I would like to pursue a bit more and explore more. Um, a side story here. So I mentioned earlier a moment ago that there was a year that I didn't have an art studio and I couldn't work on these spring portraits. And I was also depressed. And I couldn't even like wrap my head around the idea of trying to find a new studio and set it up, let alone create a large piece of art. It was intimidating. And I couldn't even draw on a sketchbook because I just felt like if it was bound in a book, it had to be perfect. And I knew that that wasn't true, but it was really intimidating. Um, but I started drawing on sticky notes. I started kind of exploring my feelings and doing visual journaling about that whole experience on just scraps of paper and sticky notes. And I have, that's from a time I got nose surgery, uh, got a deviated septum, and I thought it was going to be super easy because I got my wisdom teeth out and it wasn't a big deal, but then it was like very painful and it felt like there was a truck on my face, so I, I drew it. So this, the sticky note visual journaling is a, kind of a story that, oops, go back here. You wouldn't, you know, necessarily know about looking at all my string portraits, but it's something that helped me survive. And I have like binders of these and it's something I still do. So if I were to think, take a step back from doing mixed media stuff, delving more into illustrative and autobiographical sequential storytelling is, is something that I might do. I, I especially think um, for the sake of uh, mental health advocacy and, and having a sharing of like my own experience with that. Anyway, but if it becomes nothing, that's okay too. It's really served a good purpose in terms of helping me cope. Here's a few other examples. These ones uh, ended up being shown at a sticky note group show in Vancouver. Um, I saw a call for sticky note art and I was like, that's literally what I've been doing. So that's where I'm going to wrap it up. Um, if you want to see the whole body of the string portraits, the imaginal dialogues, you can do that at the 3D gallery. And maybe I'll do more you know, open abstract stuff. Maybe I'll use color again. I'm probably going to keep making sticky note and I'm not sure what's exactly what's next uh, in terms of big projects. Uh, I'll just take a look at my phone here to see if there's any questions. Where did I put the email? Hmm. By the Gmail app. Okay. No questions. You just have made my life so easy. Um, but if you do have something that you'd like to discuss with me at another time, please feel free to be in touch. And I'd love to chat more about art and the human condition and sticky notes and all that stuff. I don't know. Whatever. Um, I really appreciate you coming out to this talk today. I know it's only a matter of pressing a button to come to something virtually. But 
in this strange COVID time, it's also been hard for a lot of people to do that. And there's almost like an inundation of digital events and invitations that have been like coming my way and I'm sure they're coming everybody else's way. So I am really happy that you came to my talk and I hope that it has given you something to, to think about. Feel free to be in touch if you want to learn anything more about my artwork. I'm going to close us off today with a special guest performance from Edmonton Dance Theatre. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.